vulnerable people, older populations, and at a minimum, we should get ready to be able to offer a third booster shot to those. We will almost certainly be boosting those people before we boost the general population. The majority of people that aren't getting vaccinated, it's a political thing and it shouldn't be a political, a political issue. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Biden's $550 billion infrastructure bill clears its last hurdle before a Senate vote. A bumper jobs report raises bets that the Fed is close to pulling back stimulus. China's factory inflation surges, bonds and commodities sell off, and Goldman slashes the nation's growth forecast. And the UN publishes a landmark report on climate change. This is expected to be the most comprehensive and most up-to-date report on the impact of global work. So we're just looking, I think, at live pictures from Geneva, where we're expecting this report to be published. We're really just seconds away from that. Um, the UN panel says that climate change is due to human activity inequivocally. I can't say the word, but it's basically that it's definitely down to us humans that there has been climate change and that it's been extremely difficult to keep a handle on it. Now, we were speaking to our Akshat Rati, who has been really over uh, on this Bloomberg Green and climate beat for many years, and he was talking to me about the key takeaways last time we had such a big report. Now, remember, you can always watch the press conference in full by typing LIV live go on the Bloomberg terminal. We'll get back to Akshat in a second. He's been looking at the report, and of course, we'll see what this means for markets and businesses elsewhere. Now, let's get more on the markets first of all. Joining us now is Eddie Vadervalt from our markets live team. Eddie, um, we just spoke about the markets. I know there's gold you're watching, I know there's also cryptocurrencies and probably the dollar in between. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this UN report is really interesting. I don't think that it's going to have an immediate impact on the, uh, you know, on, on, on market sentiment. But what it does is it, it just puts the focus back on green bonds, on ESG, on all of those things that investors have been talking about of late. Uh, so I think this this plays into all of those big themes that we have seen develop since the start of the corona crisis, coronavirus crisis. And I think, therefore, you know, this is a continuation of uh, the bullish um, situation for commodities and for copper in particular, because ultimately, if we're moving to a more to a greener, more sustainable world, that world is dependent on copper. So, Eddie, could we actually if you look at how much more green bonds we've had since the pandemic and you look at this report and we'll get the lay down by actually Rati in a second, are you expecting even more demand for some of these green bonds? So it's not just that people look at this and we could get more pressure from citizens uh, to politicians. It could actually make an impact on the markets. Yeah, you know, I think I think for a lot of people, uh, we're well ahead of the curve of the UN. I think most people have accepted. Listen, humans have at least some 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 uh, are at least partially to blame for climate change. Um, so I think most people have already made up their minds on this. But I think yes, we do see that this just adds to that body of evidence that's driving people towards uh, green bonds. And I think therefore, what, what what the interesting thing is that 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 just lowers the cost of capital for companies that want to do the right thing. You know, there are problems with uh, green bonds, and I know that the CFA Institute has recently launched an ESG uh, qualification because they want to address some of this, these problems. And I know that Bloomberg itself has a, has a data set that we look at for how uh, adherent companies are to their ESG goals. You know, but, and so there are problems in making these bonds accountable. But I think ultimately it lowers the cost of capital for these companies. And if humanity is, I'm quite positive about this, because if humanity has seen over time, uh, you know, where we put our money and, and where we invest, we are able to solve great problems. Now, this is a great problem, but I think, you know, the markets, uh, as we see money flowing into, into these green bonds, I think ultimately that will help solve the problems. Eddie, what's gold telling us today? 
Yeah, gold very, very downbeat, particularly at the start. We had a big sell-off. Uh, on the back of the jobs report, as we spoke about earlier, the thing, the, 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 the problem for gold is that these, the, the, the drumbeat from the central bankers is just going to start turning against it. At some point, you know, whether that's at Jackson Hole or whether it's somewhere else, the central bankers are going to say, listen, we, we've got a close eye on inflation. And when they do so, we could see that paper tantrum come ahead, come, again, come through again. And, you know, the one thing that we learned from 2013 is that gold can front run the taper tantrum and, uh, you know, be the canary in the coal mine. What about crypto? Crypto, different beast altogether. I, you know, crypto is not really an inflation hedge just yet. Uh, it maybe someday it grows up to be an inflation hedge, but, but hedge, but it is not one right now. And I think for cryptocurrencies, what it's it's being driven more still by investor speculation. And I think at the moment, um, people are very bullish about the odds for a U.S. ETF um, backed by futures, so an ETC or or a, a, even an exchange traded note. Um, but I think, you know, that is ultimately what is driving cryptocurrencies at the moment. Eddie, what are you looking at in terms of, I mean, there's CPI today and then there's Jackson Hole at the end of the month. Is inflation data still the big one or inflation expectations and central bank movement still the big one that could hurt the markets? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, inflation expectations is a is a problem here. But but actually, for me, PMIs are starting to get really interesting because PMIs tell us a lot about that shift between uh, between between the services and goods. And you've been away for a bit. I, I believe I've been away for a bit. I think people are starting to take holidays again. They're spending on restaurants. They're spending not so much on keeping their home offices running, right? They're not buying goods, they, they're spending on services. And I think that is really interesting because I think that takes some of the pressure off inflation while keeping growth going. So I think that potentially, potentially just maybe the Fed is right that we're starting to see the transitory, the transitory side of the argument coming through right at this moment in time, that inflation pressures come off, growth continues, employment continues, stocks keep doing well, but, you know, commodities like gold start to sell off. Eddie, thank you so much. Eddie van der Waal there from Bloomberg MLive team. Now, coming up, infrastructure progress. The U.S. Senate clears the last hurdle for the $500 billion bill. The jobs report posts the biggest gain in a year, sending Treasury yields higher. We discuss the U.S. economy next. And then a little bit later on, we'll also talk about this U.N. report with its unequivocal uh, fact that human activities have warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. This was the major finding from the U.N. climate report. This is Bloomberg. Another incredibly strong jobs market report. Very strong report uh, across all metrics. Across the board, favorable report for the economy. Leisure and hospitality jobs, uh, those were amongst the top gainers. Service sector really shows that this recovery is coming in full force. This is a critical note for the Fed. It's not just, woo, we just got one big report. It's a month after month. Maybe this transitory inflation that's supposed to be short-lived is going to be with us a bit longer. The risks and costs are mounting. This is not going to be an earlier tightening, but it could be an earlier tapering. This is going to embed itself, and the Fed risks falling behind the curve. Very encouraging, very consequential report, but I think the next payrolls report is going to be the decision-making report for the Fed. The U.S. labor market charged ahead in July with the biggest increase in employment in nearly a year, highlighting optimism about the economy's prospects even as coronavirus concerns resurface. While the unemployment rate dropped to a pandemic low of 5.4 percent, payrolls climbed by 943,000 last month after upwardly revised increases the prior two months. Well, we're now joined by Mark Dowding. He's chief investment officer at Blue Bay Asset Management. Mark, great to have you on the program. Talk to me about the U.S. Is there a real danger that the Fed starts tapering or tightening sooner than expected? Yeah, so uh, the, the perspective we've had is that since the start of the year, the, the economy is going to do very well, and we can see the economy is doing very well, and we're, we're seeing the, uh, the jobs market uh, bouncing back. We're going to be seeing more of that in the course of the next several months. 
So we've tended to think that, um, uh, that a taper announcement is possible as early as the September Fed meeting. I think in order to get that, you, you probably need to get another 1 million jobs in terms of the next payroll figure. Uh, but we certainly think that we're on that track. Uh, and certainly, um, when you look at bond yields and you look at the recent moves in Treasuries, uh, I think that um, of late there's almost been this sense that uh, uh, the market has been somewhat disconnected from the data because the data has been going along really rather nicely. So if you look at you know some of the credit space, Mark, what are you buying right now? Well, I think in credit, um, uh, life has actually become a, a little bit less interesting. Uh, I mean, sometimes as an investor, uh, boring can be good. Uh, we're, we're seeing a, a situation where credit markets are, are largely stable. We, we'll see more activity in the return to school trade in, in September, where you see, seasonally speaking, issuance pick up. But if I was going to be picking anything in, in credit markets that we continue to like and we've liked all year, it, I'd still be highlighting uh, asset classes like subordinated financial debt, the, the uh, European bank cocos. This is a space where we still think that the pricing of credit risk is... Uh, far too great compared to the risk that investors are truly taking. And also because so many of these assets are callable in nature, uh, they won't be as exposed to a move up in yields that we think is more likely to be occurring in the coming months. And so this is a place where we, we'd be more inclined to put our own money. And this is where we're, we're, we're most overweight in our multi-asset portfolios. Uh, Mark, what's your take on, uh, you know, we heard from Jens Weidmann that actually he's worried that inflation will rise more than expected for longer than expected, and he's urged the ECB not to do too much uh, because of that. Is there, if you look at, you know, Asia, Europe, and the U.S., where's the biggest inflation concern? Well, I think we're seeing uh, an inflation um, sort of uh, move on a global basis, aren't we? Uh, I would sort of highlight that... Uh, the U.S. is very much uh, at the forefront of this because it's in a position where it's closed its output gap more rapidly. But I do think that we're going to be seeing data, important data on, on Wednesday uh, out of the U.S. on CPI, where we've now had three CPI reports surprise markets to the upside. And it seems like every time CPI is coming out and it's shocking to the upside. Um, personally, I'm more inclined to believe that uh, uh, underneath the hood, there, there is more of a sense that wage pressures are building, uh, broader price pressures are, pressures are building in things like rents and elsewhere. So I would be uh, more inclined to think that uh, uh, with U.S. inflation having gone up, it's going to stay at uh, elevated levels really for the next 18 months now. I think in Europe it's less of a worry, if, I, if I'm tr truly honest. Um, I think that the comments from... Uh, um, uh, Mr. Weidman, uh, this morning, it's got more to do with the fact that he's anxious that uh, uh, the PEP doesn't become a permanent. Uh, I think his, uh, his words were, uh, the letter P is for pandemic, it's not meant to be a permanent program. Uh, and so there is a, a bit of a battle between the hawks and the doves on the ECB to try and, uh, with the hawks looking to row back some of the monetary accommodation. But the truth of the matter is, um, even if they reduce uh, their pet purchases, we could well see other asset purchases increase at the same time. Mark, is there anything right now that actually may, I don't know whether gold is a canary in the coal mine, whether there's, there's something actually as an asset class that you're looking at to give you an indication of where the markets go in two, three months from now. So I, I'm not sure that you can read too much from a, a commodity like gold. I, I, th I think here uh, this is more um, uh, something that is, is telling you about the uh, uh, investors' views on, on forward-looking sort of uh, inflation trajectory and, and, and Fed policy. Um, I, I think that uh, if, if I was really looking at markets trying to say uh, where should we be taking a lead, I think the big question for me is uh, having seen sort of a reflation trade in the first quarter of the year and then something of a rejection of that reflation theme over the course of the last few months, are we going to be moving back into the reflation theme? And I think the, the question that you should be asking yourself as an investor is that we often see at this time of year, what is going to be the big theme that defines the back to school trade? Uh, and here, I wouldn't have been at all surprised. Uh, I'd be putting my own uh, sort of money more towards this sort of thought that we're going to go back towards a more reflationary theme uh, in the course of the next few months. As the pandemic fades, as we all hope, uh, as um, we, we continue to see uh, economies uh, do well, I'd also be emphasising, if you look at measures of financial conditions, uh, financial conditions are more accommodative today than they were this time last year. In fact, at any time ever in history, right? So you, you've yeah. got a lot of uh, juice in the economy, really, 
uh, driving that sort of reflation idea, I think, uh, as the pandemic starts to fade. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Dowding there, Chief Investment Officer at Blue Bay Asset Management, joining us this morning. Now, the UN also publishes its most comprehensive report on climate change to date. Coming up, we'll bring you the latest analysis from Bloomberg Green. This is Bloomberg. Beijing is promising a successful Winter Olympics in February. Still, a number of hurdles stand in the way, starting with transporting athletes and delegations. Officials are yet to share quarantine plans, with borders now largely sealed off. Even full vaccination against COVID may not guarantee easier access. There's evidence China's shots offer less protection against the Delta variant. International fans could be limited, but Beijing may allow home crowds capped at two-thirds of venue capacity. For other social distancing rules, organisers will have paid close attention to the Tokyo playbook. We could again, for instance, see winners putting medals around their own necks. Infrastructure is where Beijing can shine. State media says all construction work is on track. But what about the snow? Skiing events will be staged in a desert averaging eight inches of coverage per year. And China will be relying entirely on artificial flakes. That's raising environmental concerns. And then there's human rights issues. Some are calling for a diplomatic boycott of the Games. Critics, including US lawmakers, want a change in Beijing's stances on Hong Kong and Uyghur Muslims. Pressure is being applied to key sponsors, including Coca-Cola and Visa. China says any rational company will respond with the right judgment, particularly those who have benefited from its breakneck growth. With these games, Beijing has a chance to dazzle the world. Officials are said to want at least five gold medals. Another challenge for a country historically weak in winter sports. Well, look at the challenges they're facing the upcoming Beijing Winter Olympics. Now, in the meantime, let's quickly also check on the markets. A lot of the focus, of course, is on asset prices, trying to figure out what the jobs report on Friday meant for uh, Fed tapering, possible Fed tightening. So stocks are pretty much steady. Commodities are really retreating on some of these taper bets uh, in the resurgence in the fast-spreading Delta virus variant, also impacting a lot of growth, for example, growth prospects in Asia. I know China um, in focus as Goldman Sachs had to lower their forecast. Now, precious metals are selling off gold. I know our Eddie van der Waal was really into gold, touching the lowest since March before pairing some of the losses. Silver also dropping to its lowest since November. Now, let's have plenty more, of course, on this climate change. And uh, we're hearing in the last couple of minutes a lot more about the fact that it's unequivocal because of humans that we're in this state. We also heard from the UN Secretary General saying it is code red for mankind. Joining us now to digest the report is Bloomberg Green reporter Akshat Rati. Akshat, you've been working on this almost since the very beginning. You've been covering climate change and green issues for the last five to six years. What are the key takeaways for you out of this important report? I think one key takeaway to remember is that when scientists use the word unequivocal, there could not be a more uh, consensus-based view of where things are. It's not like politicians who will come out, say something sure, and then walk back. When scientists put their weight behind a word like unequivocal, we ought to listen. The other big takeaways, and some of the numbers are just astonishing uh, in the report, uh, we can now say that the past decade was hotter than any period in the last 125,000 years. Carbon dioxide levels, which is the main gas that causes warming, is at the highest level in 2 million years. And other gases, such as methane and nitrous oxide, uh, which also contribute to warming, are at a, uh, at a higher level than any time in 800,000 years. We also know from the report that scientists can now link specific weather events to climate change and point to say, the heat uh, dome in North America and say it's virtually mm -hmm. impossible without climate change.
So what does that mean ahead of, you know, Glasgow, COP26 this year, Akshat? Is this going to put a lot more pressure on politicians to do something? Like, you have this, you know, report that every media organization in the world will talk about for the next two, three, five years. Are we going to get results out of it? So one thing that happens in the process of producing this report is that 195 member countries of the UN have to agree to a word-by-word -word analysis uh, of this report, which is a summary. Um, and in that process, they have all seen the science and they are all agreed upon the science that we are discussing today. So that should certainly uh, give them a sense of urgency for why we need to be doing more. The other thing to note from the report is that scientists are now narrowing uh, the, the scope of the climate impacts that we are likely to see. And the good news is the worst case scenario might not be happening. But the bad news is the best case scenario also might not be happening, which means uh, what governments do and what humans do to change the emissions trajectory is really what's going to determine the next few decades and centuries for all of our planet. Akshat, thank you so much. That was Bloomberg Green reporter Akshat Rati after this extremely important UN report, as Akshat was saying, one of the most comprehensive reports that we've ever had that could have a serious impact also on Glasgow in November. Coming up, we'll have a full market check. We'll look at the stock 600 and treasuries. This is Bloomberg. China's factory inflation surges, bonds and commodities sell off, Goldman slashes the nation's growth forecast. Time for a booster, Anthony Fauci says the vulnerable should get a follow-up COVID jab soon as U.S. cases hit a six-month high. France introduces its virus health pass today. And Alibaba fires a manager accused of sexually assaulting an employee. The female staff's account goes viral on social media and exposes problems with the culture at China's e-commerce leader. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, let's look at the markets. There is quite a lot going on. In terms of volatility, there's nothing, of course, to envy the month of June. August has had plenty of volatility, and then we look at Jackson Hole at the end of the month. I would say that volumes are a little bit thinner than usual because a lot of the uh, European traders are probably at the beach somewhere nice if they had their green pass. The thing that we need to watch out for is some of the asset classes after we had some really good data out of the U.S. So stocks are pretty much steady, but commodities are actually retreating. Investors now weighing concerns about a pullback in stimulus and also resurgence in the fast-spreading Delta virus variant. Now, China's economic risks are building in the second half of the year, with growth set to slow as inflation pressures pick up, and that's clouding the outlook for central bank support. At the same time, the spread of the Delta variant is threatening China's growth outlook, with Goldman Sachs downgrading its GDP forecast. Now, for more, Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran, joins me from Hong Kong. Enda, thank you for joining us. So what's exactly driving the shift in outlook for China's economy? Well, Francine, we are looking at something of a new dynamic now. We're seeing the Delta variant continuing to spread despite a very aggressive push by the authorities to control it. We are seeing exports come off the boil, even on a month-on-month -month basis, so when you take out the base effects. So remember, exports was a big part of the China, the V-shaped rebound story. And then, as you mentioned, we now have the complication of producer prices in particular rebounding back up to that 9% level. This has been a thorn in the side for the manufacturing sector through the year who complain about very high input prices and a shortage of key commodities. So it is a complicated outlook. On the flip side though, even though economists are downgrading their, their outlook, the overall picture or trajectory is still for bumper growth in and around 8%. I think clearly a lot will depend on whether or not the authorities can control that virus in the near term. So, Enda, uh, what's the bigger challenge from here, growth or inflation? Well, I think, look, no doubt inflation has been a problem for the manufacturing sector in particular. I mean, we know that the government has been pushing hard to uh, take the pressure off commodity prices. They've been trying to release stockpiles of core commodities in an effort to take pressure off factories. Policymakers have been worried about uh, the rising costs that small and medium-sized enterprises are facing. So the producer inflation story is, is definitely a worry, but I think... Francine, the bigger picture here has got to be now what's happening with the growth story, and in particular consumers. Remember, consumers had never fully rebounded 
to pre-pandemic levels, even though the virus has been under control for so long in China. Spending on goods was doing well, but spending on services was not where it should have been. And you'd have to say now, with these restrictions being put in place to curb the virus spread, that will certainly weigh in the consumer story. And if the consumer story goes off tracks, then it will put broader pressure on China's recovery into the, into the end of the year. So as I say, so much depends on whether or not the authorities can control that virus in the near term. And I think that will dictate the trajectory into the end of this year. And uh, thank you so much, our Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, Enda Curran. Now, for further analysis, we're also joined by Jonathan Fenby. He's chairman of China Research at T.S. Lombard. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. When you look at China, when you look at some of the pitfalls and some of the policy mistakes that could come from China, is, uh, are you worried about the trajectory of Chinese growth because of the Delta variant? Well, there will be uh, hiccups, as we've got at the moment, uh, with the outbreak on the East Coast, which is particularly affecting uh, manufacturing centres there, um, undoubtedly. Uh, however, I think the uh, trajectory is one of continued pretty healthy growth. Uh, we're forecasting between 8 and 9 per cent growth for this year. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there's always a silver lining. The fact that there's been a COVID outbreak in Vietnam uh, and parts of Southeast Asia may mean some supply chain relocation to the mainland of China. Jonathan, I was looking at some of the, you know, banking house calls, and I have to say, because of the spread of the Delta variant, I see both Goldman Sachs, but also J.P. Morgan, a downgrading growth forecast to the third quarter and the full year, actually saying that they're expecting more from PBOC. Is PBOC, I mean, is, is there a worry that there will be a policy mistake in China, or are we going to see some kind of slowdown with quick action from central bank? Well, the action from the central bank will be to help uh, SMEs, uh, smaller um, businesses, with uh, probably another RRR cut uh, in the later part of this year. Uh, they, the PBOC doesn't want to go into full-scale easing at the moment, and they don't, I think, feel any need to do so. So monetary policy remains uh, neutral. Uh, but at the same time, we'll have probably fiscal um, and infrastructure moves uh, later on in this year to try to boost up the economy. And as Enda was just saying, particularly in order to help consumption, which is uh, the, the weak part of the China recovery story so far. So what would boost consumption at this point? I mean, apart from some of the things that PBOC could do, I mean, we're also seeing, which, you know, sitting in London is something that's quite surprising, a lot of officials being reprimanded, mid-local level officials being reprimanded because they couldn't, have, or because there, there, there was not a cap on actually COVID cases. Now, the number of COVID cases in China really pales in comparison to what we're seeing certainly in the UK mm -hmm. and in the US. I mean, does that you know, make people um, wary of spending or d do they feel protected in some way? People are still pretty wary um, about spending if the number, the data is anything to go by, uh, and that will continue. And also the vaccination program in China has been aimed primarily at working age people. Uh, older people haven't got the vaccine uh, very much, uh, and they seem to be pretty loath to go out and spend at all. So uh, spending will remain low, uh, areas like uh, catering, hospitality, are still really in the doldrums. Jonathan, I, I want to bring you up to date with a story that's just crossing the Bloomberg terminal. So I know you haven't had much chance to look at it, but China's microchip industry seems to be really feeling the hate uh, from Beijing's regulatory scrutiny. Now, this is a Bloomberg scoop. Investors, you know, are, are facing more and more Beijing actually tightening a grip on some of the regulation. Is this going to be the story, it, you know, scrutiny on e-commerce, scrutiny on technology, scrutiny on microchips? Yeah. Is this going to be the story from China for 2021? 2022 and beyond? Well, I haven't been able to see that story yet because I've been uh, speaking to you. But uh, yes, I think that is so. What we've got quite clearly uh, coming out of the suspension of the Ant uh, IPO and then the DD uh, business uh, and everything that followed from that and the education tutoring uh, clampdown is that the leadership is using regulation uh, and the regulators increasingly to push policies which are there in any 
face, but perhaps haven't had full teeth uh, as yet. And we will see that in areas of uh, national security, of self-reliance, uh, let's talk uh, tech particularly, and in the social areas, uh, which will include in, in moves to increase minimum wages, uh, get the gig workers better paid, uh, and so on. So yes, I think this regulatory wave that we've seen over the last few months will continue, and it will be uh, directed in part at areas such as microchips uh, and uh, the whole tech area, which the leadership sees as essential to building up China uh, in the way that they're aiming to do so. And that will continue at least until the Communist Party five-yearly Congress to be held in the autumn of next year. Jonathan, thank you so much. Jonathan Fenby there, chairman of China Research at T.S. Lombard, joining us this morning. Now, coming up, time for a booster. America's top infectious disease expert, Anthony Fauci, says the vulnerable should get a follow-up COVID jab soon as U.S. cases hit a six-month high. That story is up next. This is Bloomberg. Set out to develop uh, the, the, the most effective vaccine against this virus that would last for the longest possible time, uh, help the largest number of people, and be safe. And of course, we had shown a number of those things, but not the piece about how long it may last. And this was the first time we had data that at least showed that six months uh, after uh, the initial vaccinations, we're seeing essentially the same level of protection, which is very encouraging. As you said, uh, the, Delta virus, the Delta strain, as well as a number of other strains that are emerging, uh, pose a set of new threats, and we're also testing against those. So far, what we've seen is that the level of antibodies that we see in our vaccinated patients is adequate to be able to protect against those. But we do think that the, the rate at which this variant is spreading should require that we think carefully about particularly vulnerable people, older populations, certain uh, health-affected individuals whose immune systems may be weak, that at a minimum we should get ready to be able to offer a third booster shot to those and perhaps a larger number, and that's what we're waiting for the CDC and other health organizations to determine. And when it comes to the chemistry of that booster, you know, should that be offered, you know, I assume that'll take into account Delta and some of these other variants. Will it be different than the other shots already available, the vaccine that you have already available on the market because of how the virus has changed? Um, we are, as a technology developer, creating al alternative solutions so that we can let the data indicate what's the best trade-off. Right now, we've shown data that our original vaccine uh, adds so much more antibodies upon a third boost that it is highly protective also against the Delta and other strains. Uh, on the other hand, we're also developing variant vaccines in case we need to switch to a, a more potent, more directed vaccine against those variants. So we're doing the groundwork needed to have choice, and then we're going to work with the governments to be able to make sure we know what's the best solution at a given time. What we can't do in this fight is to basically trail the virus. We need to be ahead of the virus. And to do that, we need to come up with multiple solutions. So whatever the virus does, we're able to respond. When it comes to kids, you know, my kids, eight and under, they're getting ready to go back to school. Vaccines aren't ready. Where is Moderna, it, where is Moderna in terms of progress on a vaccine for 12 and under? And when that comes out, do you imagine it will be offered from 12 all the way down to you know, infants? Or will there be you know, 12 to 5 for example, a, you know, a smaller age range, and then younger children come even later? Um, we're doing the studies uh, from 12 down to six months. And as the data becomes available, and we've said this, we hope this will be towards the middle of the fall, so we're working as fast as we possibly can. The only thing we can't accelerate is time itself. We cannot do you know, studies that take two months in less than that time. And, and so some of these things are going to be taking the time it takes. But we're very actively make getting our tests done, working with the regulatory authorities and the government uh, public health folks so that we're in lockstep. And we, as soon as we can get the data, we will have it.
Well, that was the Moderna co-founder Nubar Afian speaking to Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Now, for more on the spread of the Delta variant, our senior pharmaceutical analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, Sam Fazeli, joins us. Sam, we also have news that actually the EU is now reviewing whether to let in Americans. What kind of data are they looking at? Is it, the, you know, the number of COVID cases plus the fact that there are still quite a lot of unvaccinated citizens in certain states? Yeah, good morning, Francine. Uh, you've actually answered the question. Um, it is a combination of those two, I presume. There isn't really much else to look at apart from perhaps emergence of new variants or anything, which is what the UK did when it was worrying about, or not new necessarily, worrying about French travelers until today. Um, but it's a combination of um, some states have low, relatively low vaccination rates, and, and also there is a big surge in uh, the Delta variant. I think the point being, Francine, that they're trying to avoid anyone who's infected to come over, which, um, which just seeds another infection round. So um, I, I, I really don't know why they worry so much about infection rates. So, Sam, are, are we going to see, you know, travel? Um, I don't know whether you would call it tra travel bans, but how difficult is it to travel at the moment? You could go to, I don't know, Greece, Italy, France, maybe come back to the U.S. and or, or the U.K. and have to quarantine. Is it the same true the other way around? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the U.S. has continued to keep its, um, if you want to call it a ban, ban on traveling by non-citizens and residents from other countries into the U.S., um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about wanting to go and visit my colleagues and, and, and co-workers in the U.S., and, and I'm not quite sure whether I'd be able to do it because I'm not a U.S. citizen or, or green card holder. So, but, but currently, U.S. Uh, folks can come over here and travel without any quarantine. Um, so uh, there is a dis incongruence in the, in the travel rules, and um, I don't think the U.S. ever reciprocated the opening of its borders to non-citizens. Um, what, what's your take on a, a third booster shot, Sam? Do, do vulnerable pe people new, need it? And do, um, I guess, you know, do others need it before emerging markets? Yeah, so, Francine, putting aside the very real and serious conversation about whether um, we should even be contemplating a booster dose in the West when there are so many countries that do not have any access or very low access to any vaccine, um, I think one of the critical things that we have to keep in mind is that the trials, as I think Nubar referred to from Moderna, the trials were conducted based on some assumptions with two doses, and now we might be finding out that perhaps these schedules should have been three doses to start with. Um, mm -hmm. you, just, you just couldn't have done it any other way. As suggested, you can't speed time up. So we might find out that this is a vaccine that requires at least one more dose, I'm not sure whether we need more, but certainly we might find that we need at least one more dose. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Sam Fazeli, there, a senior pharmaceutical analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, we're also some getting some breaking news out of Victura. This is the asthma uh, company or asthma, um, actually, pharmaceutical company that, for example, Philip Morris was trying to buy. A UK takeover panel is now announcing an auction procedure for Victura. Of course, Philip Morris not being the only one interested in Victoria. Now, let's get straight to the Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. TikTok owner ByteDance is reportedly reviewing plans to list in Hong Kong by early next year, despite the widening Chinese tech crackdown. The Financial Times says the listing may take place either next quarter or in early 2020. It says ByteDance has been working on addressing data security concerns raised by Chinese regulators. Virgin Atlantic is reportedly considering a public offering right here in London. Sources say executives have been holding discussions with bankers and potential investors and could announce the IPO plans within the coming months. The decision would mark the first public opportunity to buy shares in billionaire Richard Branson's flagship carrier. Saudi Aramco's profit rose to $25.5 billion in the second quarter, the highest since 2018. Free cash flow rose to $22.6 billion above the state-controlled company's dividend for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Aramco's the latest big oil giant to post bumper earnings boosted by the recovery in prices. The company says it is positive about the second half. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, Alibaba fallout. The e-commerce giant fires a manager accused of rape after an account of the ordeal goes viral. We'll bring you the full story next. 
This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Alibaba has fired a manager accused of rape, moving to contain the fallout after an employee's account of her ordeal went viral on social media. The incident exposed problems with the culture of China's e-commerce giant. While our China reporter Lucille Yu is in Beijing for us. Lucille, I mean, this is an absolutely horrendous story. Walk us through the timeline of the events. Yes, hi Francine. So we came and the public came to know about this really over the weekend um, after this post by the female employee involved went viral. Um, she alleged that this incident happened almost two weeks ago um, and that she was pressured to drink alcohol on a work trip and then um, uh, allegedly um, sexually assaulted by a client as well as her boss. Um, of course, in the aftermath, Alibaba CEO has come out and said that the incident unearthed these sort of systemic challenges to the company's mechanisms because of how it's handled initially. So what are we watching for next, Lucille? Uh, we know that the case is under police investigation, so we are watching for the results. Um, we're also watching what's happening on Chinese social media, where a lot of people have taken to the Internet to discuss uh, workplace culture as well as um, people's responsibilities when they witness something similar happening. So what does this mean for China's Me Too movement? Um, so China's Me Too movement hasn't really taken hold the same way it has in um, some other countries. Um, it came to prominence about three uh, years ago. We've seen a lot of high-profile cases since then, but most of these cases have been taken individually um, and presented uh, individually rather than a part of a larger movement. And of course, the hashtag is not something we see very often on China's social media. Lucille, does it actually lead to, you know, a change? I don't know if it's a change in culture or, a, a, you know, much more of an awareness compared to what you've seen in the past. Will this be a landmark case? Yeah, I mean, Alibaba is certainly a household name here. Um, and just a few weeks ago, we also had another very high profile case with a celebrity, um, Chris Wu, who was also who was detained <laughs> on suspicion of rape. Um, and so these cases in very cross, uh, close proximity uh, have kicked off this conversation. Um, but again, we haven't seen so many convictions and uh, consequences um, coming out of these cases. All right, Lucille, thank you so much. Our reporter on the ground there, Lucille Liu in Beijing. Now, in the meantime, let's also look at what the markets are telling us or what the markets are looking at. And stocks are pretty much steady. If you look at U.S. futures, uh, they're also steady. Commodities tumbling as investors weigh in concerns about a pullback in stimulus and a resurgence in the fast-spreading Delta virus variant. I'm looking at precious metals actually selling off, gold touching the lowest since March before pairing losses, silver dropping to its lowest since November as well. So we'll have Plenty more, of course, on that. The big one was the strong U.S. payroll state on Friday, which really raised the prospect of higher rates in the U.S., which would make precious metals and less attractive relative to other assets. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. I think Matt Miller is off, so we'll be joined by Kaylee Lyons in New York and our Danny Berger here in London. We have a full checkup of the markets. So we'll, of course, look at the CPI data in the U.S. a little bit later and this big climate change report that also came out about 55 minutes ago. We'll have you covered on all those fronts. This is Bloomberg. Let's be clear, this is a very strong report uh, across all metrics. There's, there's very little that you can point to here that's disappointing. I think in some sectors we're definitely going to need to see higher wage growth for people to come back to work. Uh, but, but I think where we're headed right now, I mean, all signs are incrementally going in, in a good positive direction. What is indisputable now is this. The Biden plan is working. The Biden plan produces results, and the Biden plan is moving the country forward. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keeley Lines. 
It's 10 a.m. here in London, 11 a.m. in Berlin, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Monday, August 9th. Our top stories today. The USN is, is one step closer to passing the infrastructure bill. A final vote could take place as early as today. Economic risks rising in China. Inflation pressures pick up while growth is forecast to slow down. And flash crash gold recovers after prices drop $60 in a matter of minutes. Well, I'm Francine Lackley here in London. Danny Berger with me in London. Kay Lines in New York. It's also Kaylee's birthday, but we'll <laughs> deal with that a little Happy bit birthday. later. Matt Miller actually off today. I know there's quite a lot on the markets, Kaylee, because after that really blowout U.S. jobs number on Friday, asset prices are now trying to figure out what it means for Ted tapering or even tightening. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Francine. And I have to say, having you back with us is the best birthday present I should possibly receive. We <laughs> missed you so very much. As for what everybody missed in the Asian session overnight, I would note Japanese markets were closed for a holiday, but other than that, it was broadly higher, including in Hong Kong and in China. Chip makers, though, both in Hong Kong and listed in Shanghai, were under a bit of pressure after state media talked about regulators cracking down on chip speculation. Aside from the chips, though, we did see the CSI 300 up about 1.3%, even in the face of this inflation data we got overnight. Factory prices up 9%. Core consumer prices jumping the most in 18 months. So you're getting higher inflation at the same time the Delta variant is threatening growth prospects. And we saw Goldman Sachs downgrading its forecast for Chinese, uh, Chinese growth as a result of that. Ahead of or after all that data, I should say, we did see some movement in the Chinese bond market up as much as four basis points. Right now, that 10-year yield at 2.86%. And then a lot of action as well in the commodity complex. On the one hand, you have iron ore futures in Singapore down more than 4% as uh, signs that China's attempts to crack down on steelmaker production is indeed uh, happening and waning uh, demand. And then, of course, at the start of the Asian session, we saw a big flash crash in some of the precious metals. Gold down as much as 4%, silver as much as 7%, though we are off those levels now. Gold futures down just about 8 tenths of 1%. Here in the U.S., of course, we are coming off that surprise, upside surprise on payrolls on Friday. And after that, as traders digest it, we are seeing futures a touch softer, down about two tenths on S&P 500 E-minis uh, ahead of the opening bell here in the U.S. And then the 10-year yield, of course, coming off its biggest weekly increase uh, we've seen, the only increase we've seen since June, in fact, on a weekly basis. But we're ticking just a basis point lower today. Uh, sitting at 1.29%. The dollar is fractionally stronger. A lot of the commodity currencies under pressure in the G10 space today, and that is not just to do with gold and silver, silver, but also oil. Oil coming off of its worst week since October, and the loss is continuing in a big way this morning, Danny. We're down 4% on WTI futures, now trading with a 65 handle for a barrel of crude, Danny. And Kaylee, that oil loss clearly having an impact on these European markets. Specifically, I direct your attention to the FTSE 100 UK stocks down two tenths of 1%. A lot of oil majors live there. So if you're going to have any weakness, that's where it's going to show through. Otherwise, a pretty soggy day here in the European session, mostly down or flat. The one exception being Italy up three tenths of a percent, clearly still basking in the glory of just having Francine Lacroix visit the country. So that's the one <laughs> outperformer. But really, we are seeing a lot of tech outperform. So some of those tech names doing well in Italy. That means at a headline index, the stock 600 basically unchanged, searching for direction so far this morning. Now, the 10-year ten, the ten German bond yield as well as the euro dollar, this is really dictated by the jobs number we had on Friday. A stronger dollar yields moving up a little bit in the U.S. That really is what's impacting these two assets, though Jens Weidman of the ECB did say that inflation to the upside is the risk that we should be pricing in. But really, he he is the lone hawk among the doves. So that not getting priced in too much at the moment. So your dollar at 117.55. Finally, Francine Deliveroo, the big outperformer, the best performer on the stock 600 today, up nearly 10%. So this is a food delivery app in London, based in London, rather, a German food delivery app, Delivery Hero, taking a 5% stake. I think the most fascinating thing about this story, Francine, is the staying power of delivery apps. It's really sticky. Yeah. People are still at home delivering delivering food even though restaurants are open now. I mean, I feel like I'm, you know, first of all, I spent my weight, I mean, I ate my weight in gelato in Italy and also spent uh, probably like two months check in gelato. And then I came back and ordered through Deliveroo because now you can get groceries. So, of yeah. course, it's a game changer uh, when you come back home after a trip. We also have the big take. Danny, I love this story. It's basically, where's Bill Huang? He's mm. in New Jersey, apparently. So In New Jersey. In New yeah. Jersey. It's a great story. It just <laughs> dropped 
Okay, okay, I'm sure ordering a lot of delivery food. I mean, probably incognito. <laughs> exactly. I'll look at what else is ahead this week. Now, starting today, uh, fully vaccinated U.S. residents will be allowed into Canada for non-essential travel. Tomorrow, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester discusses inflation risks at a virtual event. U.S. inflation also in focus on Wednesday as we get CPI data. On Thursday, OPEC publishes its latest monthly oil market report. Now, the $550 billion infrastructure bill has cleared its last procedural hurdle in the U.S. Senate. A vote on final passage could take place as soon as today. Let's get straight to Anne-Marie Hordern, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, who joins us from our D.C. Bureau. Anne-Marie, I'm excited to see you. I'm also excited that we may be closer <laughs> to a resolution on the infrastructure bill. Yeah, we certainly are, Francine. Senators working through the weekend, passing through some of these procedural hurdles, which sets up a final vote on this legislation. Potentially, we could see it today. They convene at noon, so potentially later into this evening. Or, if worse comes to worse, it'll be tomorrow, because there are some amendments that remain elusive that they have to get to. One of them is regarding cryptocurrency, and that's really about how much of the industry are you going to um, go after in terms of regulatory requirements. There's two different amendments circulating on that front and then another regarding COVID bills. Um, but the mood of the Senate is that this is likely going to pass. And then what comes next is going to be very interesting. And that is the Democrats setting up a budget resolution to prepare for the reconciliation bill they plan on hammering out this September. So is that the timeline that Anne Marie we won't see any front on the uh, any progress on the trillions of dollars in human infrastructure social spending until the fall? It'll be a framework that we'll see this week, and then senators are out of here, and they're going on a uh, holiday for their August recess. And then when it comes back in September, that is really when we're going to see, Kaylee, those details really start to percolate on what is going in this $3.5 trillion reconciliation package, Democrat-only package. Um, and what already we are starting to see in Congress is that it is going to be a contentious autumn as we see the two factions of the Democrat Party really battle out how much should go into this and how much spending they're willing to take. Anne-Marie, thanks so much for Anne-Marie Hordern there over in Washington, D.C. Now, China's economic risks are building. Growth set to slow and inflation pressure is actually picking up. Both Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan have downgraded their growth forecast given the spread of the Delta variant. Well, let's get more with our Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, Enda Curran. So, Enda, first of all, what's driving this shift in outlook for China's economy and what does it mean for central banks? Well, we're seeing a new dynamic for China's economy now, Francine. The Delta variant continues to spread and the authorities are struggling to contain it right now. That, of course, will have an impact on consumer spending. At the same time, of course, we're seeing exports slow down. Exports have been a key part of China's V-shaped rebound. And now we're seeing producer prices or factory inflation head higher again, back to 9%. That's a complication and will limit what a central bank can do to support the economy. So when you take it all together, economists are downgrading their forecasts. They're not yet calling a hard landing or anything like that for China, but it certainly is a different picture for the second half of the year compared to what it was as recently as, say, two months ago. And uh, given the data you're pointing out, what's more of a concern for China? Is it inflation or is it growth? Well, I think obviously producer prices have been a key concern for the government this year. Factories have been complaining about very high commodity prices and, of course, a shortage of inputs, key inputs, everything from plastic through to screws for the products that they make. But at the same time, the authorities will take a bigger picture on this and they will look at what's happening to the overall economy and that's growth. And I think in particular they'll want to see what's happening with the consumer as they impose these tough restrictions to try and curb the spread of the Delta virus. If that does hurt the consumption story, that's a bigger threat to the economy, I think, than the producer price story. So everything depends on how the virus plays out from here. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economics Correspondent, Enda Curran. Now, gold is recovering this morning after a flash crash that saw prices drop $60 in minutes. Investors are concerned that the Fed may soon start paring back its monetary stimulus. Bloomberg MLive commodity strategist Eddie Vandervault joins us now. So, Eddie, was this just Asia catching up to the payrolls report on Friday? There's a little bit of that going on. I also think that there was just probably some gold selling going on on the weekend, and we are only really seeing that register on COMEX early doors. Really, that payrolls report you mentioned, that was the worst of all worlds for gold. Because on the one hand, we had a bumper reading. The economy is doing well. You know, jobs growth is picking up. The Fed will like that. That will give them an opportunity to raise. On the other hand, wage inflation beat expectations. And that is another uh, factor that will really worry the gold bulls. Because again, 
again, that, that forces the, the Fed's hands in perhaps uh, raising rates. Eddie, it's not just precious commodities that are taking a dive today. Oil also under a lot of pressure, under $70 a barrel for both WTI and crude. What are the main drivers dragging oil lower today? Uh, there are so the, the oil market really under pressure, as you say. I think at one point when I was checking, uh, down three percent or more on WTI and on Brent. And really, I think there's a different set of drivers here. I think for oil, the problem is the Delta variant, the spread of the Delta variant, the pace of the Delta variant. They're worried about, you know, particularly more lockdowns in China. And uh, you know, China's shown that they want to be aggressive on on curbing this breakout, and that could really curb oil demand, which will uh, put prices under significant pressure. All right, Bloomberg M Live strategist Eddie Vandervault, thank you so much. And Eddie there just talking about the decline we're seeing in oil, and that is leading to some declines in energy stocks in pre-market trading here in the U.S. Your biggest large cap underperformer, Marathon Oil, down the better part of 4% in early hours. This stock already off about 16% from its peak just last month. To the upside, though, maybe some potential deal uh, action or at least talks. Invita Group up uh, about a 9% in early hours on report. Exact Sciences has approached the company about a possible merger. Those talks aren't active. No guarantee of a deal, but still investors are bidding up that stock. And another stock getting bid up is, of course, by the Reddit traders. We have to talk about what's going on on StockTwits and on other forums. The future fintech group, it is a blockchain company. It is up about 14.4% in early hours. This is a very small company, not even a $200 million market cap for Anstein, but nonetheless, retail traders seem to like it. Oh, I like Future Fintech Group. We'll have plenty more on that uh, shortly as well. Uh, Kaylee, coming up, Freddie Late, Latitude Investment Founder and Chief Investment Officer. And then a little bit later, we'll be speaking to Louis Lukens. He's Signum Global Advisor, Senior Partner. I know he'll have a thing or two to say about infrastructure and what the next steps are. When could actually President Biden sign this? That's uh, the million-dollar question the market is waiting for. This is Bloomberg. is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger with Francine Lacroix in London and Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, the jobs number on Friday really changing the picture for what it means with what you're going to do with yield. So I'm looking at the U.S. 10-year real yield, and I also want to welcome our radio listeners as well. I know you can't see this chart, but let me explain it to you. It is the weekly movement in the U.S. 10-year real yield. And for the past seven weeks, that real yield has declined. But after getting that blow out jobs number on Friday, it all of a sudden perked up the real yield, rising 11 basis points for the entirety of the week. That is the biggest weekly gain uh, since back here around the beginning of the year in February. So again, for our radio listeners, this was a really big change of what we saw in the real yield and went counter to the trend that has building over the past month or so. So the question that this chart really raises is do we have to approach markets differently now? Now that we have this bigger jobs number, how much of a regime shift really was that jobs number that was much stronger than what was expected. Well, let's give that question to our next guest. It's Freddie Late, founder and CIO of Latitude Investment. Freddie, first off, thanks so much for joining us today. So this perk up in real yields and the jobs number, does this to you indicate a regime shift in this market? Good morning, Danny. Um, I, I don't see it as necessarily a regime shift because I think most of the information we've been getting from the central banks and, and from the markets over the last three to six months has been that we should be moving towards a tapering maybe towards the end of this year and a normalization over the next few years according to the dot plots and the language around it. So we should be expecting that anyway. What this does is it firms up that signal. There is still an argument that you know uh, next year may be very difficult for the economy and real yields could stay yeah. low. But if we see an improvement, as we saw in the jobs number, coming through other data points, it firms up that signal that we will engage with tapering Freddie, in the near future. And then you look at gold and you kind of think, well, what exactly is happening with gold? Is it the canary in the coal mine? 
Absolutely. Well, gold and real yields, if you compare a chart of 10-year real yields with gold, um, they're very, very similar trades. And I think what's been happening is gold has been rolling over ahead of the tips yield and is potentially indicating further weakness in the tips yield, i.e. a rising real yield in America, which I think would be a good sign from an economic perspective. But it is really the price, real or nominal yields, that is being used to, to price equity markets, infrastructure assets, housing markets, etc. And so it could cause a, a reversal of some of the asset price inflation we've seen. So it's definitely something to watch uh, for yeah. markets as a whole. You're right. Freddie, to go back to bonds, we have a great opinion piece out on the terminal this morning from Bill Dudley, the former New York Fed president. And in part, he says, quote, quantitative easing has sustained the bull market in bonds beyond what is consistent with longer term fundamentals. If the bond market is disconnected from the fundamentals, does the equity market need to pay attention? Yes and yes. I think the bond market probably is uh, being manipulated, maybe too strong a word because it's very public what they're doing, but the 10-year the, the real ten year yield is not the right price for a sort of free market price for the 10-year yield. It is due to excessive central bank buying. Uh, equity markets compared to bonds are not as, a, as extreme, but I do believe that if, if bond markets were allowed to get to where Bill Dudley or I may suggest they would be under normal circumstances, uh, given the strong level of growth, strong level of money supply uh, and demand, you may see lower equity markets still. So I think there's something in, in the price for equities judging a little bit of the risk of, uh, of rate rises, but not a lot. And I think if they do move sharply, you will see further weakness in the equity markets. Freddie, you'll have to forgive me because I now want to take you into the world of del derivatives and specifically what we're seeing around FX volatility. At the moment, the markets, when it comes to the yen, are pricing more volatility around the next jobs number when it comes to the August report versus Jackson Hole. Do you think that's correct? Do you think that there should be a, a bigger risk premium attached with Jackson Hole versus the jobs data? It's a very good question. Uh, I think FX volatility, as an aside, will continue to rise dramatically from a fundamental perspective over the next three to six months, as I think that's probably going to be the outlet for traders these days. It's less manipulated by central banks, things like that. Um, in terms of which matters more, um, it's it's quite circular. You know, the, the Fed will take a read from the next jobs number. I, I do think yep. that at Jackson Hole, it's unlikely we see a bombshell tapering announcement, but we will see conversation about it. Therefore, I suppose the argument is it's more predictable, whereas the next job number, high skew upwards or high skew downwards, could cause major volatility. So it's probably right that the markets are pricing in excessive volatility due to the uncertainty led by the jobs market. Uh, Freddie, how much does that have to do also with low volumes? And actually, when are you expecting uh, the Fed to start tapering? Well, I don't know, but it, it, it feels like the end of this year, <laughs> you know, Q4, Q1 would be my, my guess, but judging by the underlying economic scenario. I mean, I think they could already be doing it, frankly, from an economic perspective. Right. But there's another couple of things to say. Firstly, you know, well, the, the main one is this. The main one is that fiscal spending is out of control. The infrastructure bill is probably going to get passed today in mm -hmm. the States. Fiscal spending across Europe and the UK, it, it's out of control. And the central banks are the only buyers of that debt at present. You know, people are not willing to fund governments at negative real yields, right. which is why quantitative easing may have to carry on for longer than we'd like to believe. Freddie, thank you so much. I thought you were going to make us all millionaires and we could go, go home with your huge Fed call. So we'll get you back on to make the, the you know, to <laughs> ask you again to, to predict it. Freddie Late, founder and chief investment officer of Latitude Investment. Now, coming up a little bit later today, we'll also speak with the former New York Fed president, Bill Dudley, about his latest Bloomberg opinion column. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lack with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news and a new report from the world's top climate scientist sees no end to rising temperatures before 2050. The assessment comes from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It says the planet will keep warming unless there are drastic moves to eliminate greenhouse gas pollution. Now the UN Secretary General calls a report a code red for humanity. Alibaba has fired a manager accused of rape. Well, China's largest e-commerce company is trying to contain the fallout after an employee's account of her ordeal went viral. The story has ignited debate about rampant sexism in China's tech industry.
Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is reaping the benefits of the U.S. recovery. Now, the conglomerate's collection of manufacturers and retailers bounced back in the second quarter. That group of businesses posted its second highest quarterly profit in data going back to the middle of 2009. Overall, Berkshire's profit rose 21%. And ESPN reports that soccer superstar Lionel Messi has already reached a deal with Paris Saint-Germain. Messi said goodbye to his long-term club Barcelona in an emotional, very emotional news conference. The club is not renewing Messi's contract because of financial problems. He's widely regarded as the best player of his generation. I mean, I even watched the um, press conference. I'm not, you know, a huge Barcelona fan, but I was kind of tearful because yeah. he gave yeah. so much to the club and they gave so much back to him. Yeah, it's so true. I mean, it was really emotional, but I have to say the amount that PSG must be paying for him, not only do they have to match his pay, but they also have to buy out the Barcelona contract. We're talking about hundreds of millions of euros here. Yeah, I have to say, Danny, I don't really pay much attention to European soccer or football, whatever you want to call it, here in the U.S., but even I know <laughs> who Lionel Messi is and what he means for the sport, and this is definitely a saga that a lot of people here in the U.S. are also watching as this plays out in Europe, Francine. Yeah, I can tell you for free that actually at 34 years old, he's considered a, a, an oldie in football terms. Coming up next, Louis Lukens, Signum Global Advisors senior partner. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lack with Danny Berger in London, Kaylee Lines in New York, and Matt Miller is off today. Now, if you look at the markets, every asset class, Danny, is trying to figure out how they should interpret the jobs date on Friday, mm. what it means for the Fed. And we're talking about tapering, of course, before tightening, but there's still that question mark on how soon it can come. Exactly. And all of that movement meant that commodities absolutely falling out of bed, yeah. whether you look at gold, silver or oil as well. But of course, Francine, a big part of it, and we talked with Andy Vanderwall earlier today, is just the liquidity gap that's in the market. And this is, of course, something you asked Freddie Late as well. Yeah, one of the things that we need to try and figure out is, of course, what asset class will come out trumped and whether there is something more sinister out there. Kaylee, what are mm. you seeing in the markets? Well, in Europe, Francine, it's interesting. The stock 600 did hit a record high again earlier today, but right now that index is essentially flat. Right now, actually down not even a single point. And here in the U.S., as we assess that jobs data, an upside surprise on Friday, we are seeing futures pointing to a lower open in about four hours' time, down about two-tenths of a percent on S&P 500 futures. In the bond market, we did see yields rise last week on the weekly uh, on a weekly basis. That is the first time that has happened since back in June, though we are inching just lower by about a basis point this morning. The 10-year yield sitting at 1.28%. And as Danny was talking about commodities under some pretty immense pressure, specifically when it comes to oil, already saw its worst week last week since October, and now those losses are continuing. And we're down more than four percentage points on WTI, trading at around $65.41 a barrel. Concerns about the Delta variant, really the story here and what is going to do to oil demand. And no surprise with those declines in oil, looks like energy will be, be the big underperformer on a sector basis come the opening bell. The energy select sector spider ETF down about 2% in pre-market trading and your biggest laggards on a single name basis in early hours are energy companies. Marathon Oil down about 4% as is Occidental Petroleum and even Apache down the better part of 3%, Danny. Kaylee, I want to stick in the U.S. because after Friday's job report, the question is, are what are the next catalysts that move the market? And certainly inflation is going to be in focus with CPI and PPI this week, as well as the infrastructure bill. Well, to really give us a view of what inflation has meant for these markets and economists, I am looking at the City Surprise Index specifically for inflation. And I want to welcome all of our radio listeners as well. I know you can't see this chart, but essentially what it shows is it moves higher if inflation is surprising to the up side and moves lower if it's surprising to the downside. Well, again, for the benefit of a radio audience, at the very past couple months, and indeed the last couple readings, an outrageous reading on the surprise index to the upside. It's about 86. And to give you a frame of reference, in years past, the highest figure was about 42 in 2008. So this, we've seen just these repeatedly big, big surprises of inflation to the upside. Will we continue to get that? What will this week's numbers bring? And of course, Francine, does the 
the passing or very much so likely passing of a more than half trillion infrastructure plan, does that continue to drive these inflation numbers even higher? Yeah, and we have stories, of course, of also, the, you know, the lack of raw material to build some of this infrastructure. Now, to Washington, as Danny was saying, a vote in the U.S. Senate on that $550 billion infrastructure package could come as soon as today. Now, the legislation has broad bipartisan support, but amendments on the table remain uncertain. So to talk about this, we're joined by Lou Lukens. He's Signum Global Advisors senior partner. Lou, I feel like this is a big moment because we've been talking about the infrastructure package for about four or five months. I feel like this is, you know, the defining moment for the Biden administration. What are you expecting? Well, I mean, Francine, we've been talking about this for years. I mean, remember during the Trump administration, every week seemed to be infrastructure week. So I think this is a huge moment for the Biden administration. President Biden and his team have worked really closely and really hard with Senate leadership and House leadership to try to craft a package that can get bipartisan support. And it's all coming together. Finally, it's been a rough road, but it's happening. And I think by later tonight or early tomorrow morning, this bipartisan infrastructure bill will pass in the Senate. The question is, then it goes to the House. The House is on recess until September 20th. So not much will happen until the end of September. And then the House has to take it up and either pass it as it is or try to reconcile it with their own vision of infrastructure. Um, my guess is that they'll pass it pretty close to what it is to give Joe Biden this bipartisan win before the end of the fiscal year. Yeah, we understand that Schumer also plans to turn quickly to passing a budget resolution, right, that, that will then set the stage for everything else. How quickly can, th can this all be done? Well, I, Schumer will try to get the budget resolution passed this week. And, and the senators, this will be Democrats only, right? But the 50 Democratic senators, as well as the rest of the, of the chamber, want to go on vacation. They want to get back to their districts um, this weekend. So there's a bit of time pressure to get this done. Schumer will get this done this week. And then, again, it goes over to the House where nothing much will happen. The challenge, the real challenge for Nancy Pelosi is that this is a $3.5 trillion budget resolution. Right. We don't think the, the second re reconciliation piece will come in that high because there's a lot of pressure from the more moderate Democrats to bring down the price tag. And there'll be this, they'll have to walk a fine line, the leadership will, between keeping the progressives happy right. with lots of big items and, and, and keeping the moderates happy. So, Lou, as you said, that reconciliation part will be Democratic only. It will be partisan. Does that cancel out the bipartisan? Does it count as compromise if you're compromising on some things and then just shoving through everything else you wanted in the first place? Well, I mean, the Democrats will argue that this is what Joe Biden was elected to do and this is their mandate. The Republicans will argue, certainly, that the Democrats are going on this crazy spending spree with, without any Republican support. Um, you know, I, I, I think the fact that they will do a budget reconciliation piece does not detract from the bipartisan nature of this bipartisan bill, which is going to get passed later tonight. So let's talk about the political capital it gives the Biden administration. Does this make it easier to get some of his other initiatives through Congress? Well, no. I mean, I think, you know, th this will probably be the only bipartisan package that gets done this year. Um, everything else will be done by the Democrats using the budget reconciliation process. So I don't think that the passage of this bipartisan infrastructure bill necessarily makes other legislation easier. I think the Republicans will feel they've done their bit to, to, to sort of promote bipartisan governance, and, and they're done now. And they will say anything else beyond this, whether it's voting rights or immigration reform or more spending, um, is they, they won't agree with that. Lou, when it comes to some of the details of this infrastructure bill, Allison Schrager of Bloomberg Opinion writes that a lot of the benefit is undone by about 60 pages worth of buy American, build American. And she argues that our economy, it's more global, that focusing on American manufacturers means that often we'll also have to pay for higher prices. Do you see this as an issue as well? Well, I, Joe Biden has been very clear that he's focused on buy America and restoring American manufacturing. And I think the reason that, the, that these items are in this bill is to, is to promote that and to reinforce that. Yes, it will certainly make some of the projects more expensive, but there's still a lot of money that's going to be flowing into the U.S. economy over the next five years or so. I mean, we think at Signum probably a total of two and a half to three trillion dollars in infrastructure spending when this is all said and done. Um, and it's going to be an incredible boost, I think, to the American economy. And inflation, Lou, are, should we really worry about inflation? Are we measuring the kind of inflation that we'll get from the, from the package, right? Well, it's hard to say because the package will be spread out over five to eight years. And so 
uh, I think you know what we're seeing now. This sort of transitory inflation is is not um, is, is different from what you know. There, if there's going to be long-term inflation that comes out of the spending bill, I think that the, the spending bill, the infrastructure spending bill, is going to take a while to get off the ground. There are certainly some shovel-ready mm -hmm. sh shovel projects around the country. Um, but a lot of this is money is going to take a while to trickle into the economy. So I think it's too early to say whether there'll be inflationary um, results from this. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lou Lukens, their senior partner at Signum Global Advisors. Now coming up, time for a booster. Will America's top infectious disease expert, Anthony Fauci, says the vulnerable should get a follow-up COVID jab soon. That story is next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later on today, an exclusive interview with Carson Block, Muddy Waters CEO. This is Bloomberg. We do think that the, the rate at which this variant is spreading should require that we think carefully about particularly vulnerable people older populations, certain uh, health-affected individuals whose immune systems may be weak, that at a minimum we should get ready to be able to offer a third booster shot to those and perhaps a larger number, and that's what we're waiting for the CDC and other health organizations to determine. We need to look at them in a different light than the durability for a normal person, which means that we will almost certainly be boosting those people before we boost the general population that's been vaccinated. And we should be doing that reasonably soon. That was Moderna co-founder Nubar Afayan and America's top infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci speaking about COVID-19 booster shots. And sticking with the virus, the EU is likely to discuss reintroducing travel restrictions on visitors from the U.S. as coronavirus case numbers rise again. And from today, people in France will now need to show a health pass to enjoy activities like going to a cafe or traveling on public transportation. Let's get more on this with Sam Fazelli, senior pharmaceuticals analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. So Sam, tackling the the booster shot of this equation first. Is giving people a third shot of an existing vaccine enough or do the vaccines themselves need to be recalibrated to combat these variants? Yeah, good morning. I mean, that's an excellent question. It seems so far that the data that they've published, Pfizer said it, and so has Moderna, I think, although they, Moderna did try the um, uh, a vaccine kind of based on the beta variant sequence. And they found that they are uh, pretty much um, uh, the same in terms of their ability to neutralize any variant once you give a third boost of exactly the same vaccine that we've just had. So it doesn't look like we need to necessarily go down that route, but there is some nuances that still have to be worked out, I think. I mean, I'm so exhausted, Sam, of all these variants. Like, you know, when do we find out, when the variants come up, how quickly are we to analyze if they're more deadly or you can transmit it more? Like, you know, are, are, are virologists working round the clock to try and figure out what happens next? Yep, this is unfortunately, Francine, this is a um, going to be a never, I'm not going to say never ending, but not ending for a while story in that the virus doesn't wait for us. It's got, um, it's got certain capabilities to mutate um, just randomly on, a, on, 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 on a roughly one mutation per two weeks is what the estimate is. But then, of course, if you give it lots of people to mutate in, uh, which I think is what we're doing at the minute, then, then you'd get a whole population of those. So I, I think virologists are doing the best they can. Um, the question is we need more sequencing, which we've said all along from different countries, and, and, and even normal testing has dropped in the U.S. Hmm. And I mean, in the U.S., you have rising cases that, as Kaylee mentioned, is, is causing the EU to look, should we no longer allow U.S. passengers into the country? But, Sam, I wonder with these kind of travel curbs, when is it too little, too late? When is the right time to act? Yes. Uh, well, as the United Kingdom has proven and other countries have proven, there probably isn't a particularly right time to act. Because even in Europe, where they tried very hard to keep the Delta variant out, it's, it's arrived and it's everywhere, in every country. So the, the virus finds a way in unless we completely seal ourselves up, which, of course, some countries have. And those countries will have other issues to deal with as time comes. But if you look at the case counts, the U.S. is already 
almost three twice as much per capita in terms of number of cases. And yeah. that really, that crossed the line between Europe mm -hmm. and the U.S. around the um, end of July. So is it too late? Um, I mean, it's not about variants. It's about worrying about importing more cases than the yeah. European continent already has. So, Sam, given the U.S. case curve and the way that it is going pretty much straight upwards at this point and the vaccination rate and the number of people who've already had COVID here stateside, is there reason to believe that we could see that starting to turn the other way in the near future? Yes. So if you look at what happened in the United Kingdom, very different countries, I understand, very different levels of vaccinations. One would hope that the U.S. should be reaching a peak if you'd simply follow the U.K. Uh, path. Uh, of course, with lower vaccination rates, that's likely to be later. But, but all these waves do eventually crest. The, the, the difference is people need to pay attention to methods of reducing the virus from passing from one person to the other. If they're not going to be doing that in the U.S., then unfortunately that crest will get later and later and later. Sam, I was in Italy last week and, you know, from last Friday you had to show a pass saying that you were vaccinated to uh, dine indoors, for example. I think the same is true for France today. Does that really help people get vaccinated or is there an initial boost of, let's say, two million people wanting to get vaccinated and then that dies down? Um, well, it will, it will eventually die down because there are some people who can't get vaccinated because of the various issues they have or they're not le eligible yet. But there will be some diehards who just won't take the vaccine and, 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 and then it will be interesting to see how that pans out. If you look at the number of people protesting in the streets in France, for example, those diehard anti-vaccine uh, folks, that which may not all be anti-vaccine, there may be some of those people who are genuinely worried about their, uh, their, 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 their rights. So I'm not, I'm not criticizing them. What I'm saying is if, if they are all anti-vaccine, there aren't that many because you see these um, events mm. and there aren't that many people there. So maybe, fingers crossed, we can cross that uh, barrier. All right, Sam, we'll have to also get you back on to talk about kids' vaccines as we're approaching, some will say, you know, the back to school, although it's still three weeks away, as I'm sure all small kids like to remind their parents. Sam Fazelli, Senior Pharmaceuticals Analyst for Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, coming up in the next hour, more with Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Vice Dean Joshua Scherfstein. They'll ask him, of course, about COVID-19, some of the rising cases and travel. That's at 6.30 a.m. in New York, 11.30 a.m. in London, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix with Danny Berger in London. Kaylee Lines is in New York. Now, billionaire investor Leon Cooperman says the short-term prospects for stocks are rosy, but the long-term outlook remains cloudy. My long-term concerns are, I think, we're kind of borrowing from the future. You know, uh, Laura Tyson's a very distinguished economist. I know she's still listening, but I would say if I lined up 100 economists and asked them what is the potential real growth of the U.S. economy, response would be centered around 2% real. And that's be a function of uh, labor force growth, which is about a half of 1% per annum, and productivity growth, which is about 1.5% per annum. So that determines real growth in any economy. So 2% real, if you're an economic bull, you say 2.5%. If you're bear, you say 1.5%. Add to that about 2% for inflation. So nominal GDP grows 4%. Uh, we have real growth this year of four times potential, yet the Fed is holding interest rates near zero. Makes no sense to me. I, I, I understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, but I think it's going to have a bad end to it. Secondly, you just referenced it a minute ago. You know, we've already injected into the economy a trillion dollars of stimulus in excess of wages lost, yet they're trying to do another two or three trillion on top of that. And so, you know, this nation was founded 245 years ago. We had no national debt. Three years ago, it was about 20 trillion. I think now it's knocking the door 28 trillion. And it's growing at a rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy. And when this party ends, basically, it's not going to end well. Well, that was billionaire investor Leon Cooperman speaking on Bloomberg Wall Street Week. Now let's get straight to Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, who joins. Tom, I know you want to look about, you know, at employment or unemployment. I also want to ask you about infrastructure. Well, market's and sort good of morning. Mar good morning. Market's sort of uh, quiet. 
and oil a little bit south, but we're still picking up the pieces from the Friday jobs report. What a marathon that was with good, good revisions as well. The, the, the regular vanilla unemployment rate really speaks volumes here. I saw this on all sorts of economist research reports. I know J.P. Morgan, Michael Ferroli uh, wrote it up. This is how far back we are to normal. And Francine, it's simple. We're getting there, not near a 4% unemployment rate, but we're getting there. Hmm. Tom, I want to get your take, too, on what we've seen in commodities. Some of the precious metals may be off of session lows, but oil still getting absolutely hammered. Yeah, well, it's a global feel here, and there's a global slowdown. I think, uh, Kaylee, mostly it comes off of the realization stronger dollar, resilient dollar means weaker EM, and that devolves right away into China and to EM, and that gets you to West Texas Intermediate 65.40. Tom, when it comes to those unemployment numbers, I know you've been speaking to a lot of your guests, whether the figures capture the modern economy, whether there's been a paradigm shift and we have the sort of TikTok jobs. What's been the take after this job report? Do we trust this data? We don't say paradigm on Mondays. It's too stressful. <laughs> oh, but my yeah, bad. I get my your bad, point. <laughs> I get your point. It's very paradigmatic. And the answer is it doesn't capture everything. That's why there's four, five, six flavors of unemployment, right? That's the headline number that we just showed. But all in all, is the American labor economy where it is? Yeah, it's where it is. But what's really important to watch here over the next 60 days is wage dynamics. To me, that's the number one thing. It took me, I, you know, Francine, the Bentley broke down this morning and I had to take <laughs> lift. And I'm telling you, get in the car in the morning it's just is not tough. The same. Yeah. It's tough. <laughs> it is tough. Tough. You know, you're looking very dapper in that linen suit. You know, fitted for the Riviera, maybe in France. Oh, I got a message. The economy is booming. Yeah, I got a message from Pharaoh's people, and they said, "Look Italian this weekend." So I said, "Okay." <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm expecting the whole week of Italian looks. Tom Keen, their co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Now we have uh, plenty more coming up today and the rest of the week. This is what we're watching today. First of all, all about infrastructure, Kaylee finally closer to some kind of resolution closer still not there yet Francine but maybe we will see a final vote in passage later on today or in worst case perhaps tomorrow it was a long weekend for senators on Capitol Hill but they voted last night to limit debate on this 550 billion dollar bipartisan package 18 Republicans joining all 50 Democrats in that so it does indicate that it has bipartisan support but some the fate of some of the amendments like the one with new tax rules on cryptocurrency transactions still kind of left in limbo so we will look and see if we get any answers on that and if we actually do get this thing passed, Danny. Kaylee, I'm looking at something a bit more micro, though, with a macro twist, and that's beyond tech earnings. They're going to report before the bell in the U.S. session. It'll be interesting to see because, of course, they have the vaccine. And in Pfizer's earnings, a large chunk they got from vaccine revenue. So we'll see what that means for beyond tech. But also, their analyst questions and commentary during the call, what it looks like in terms of booster shots, what demand looks like globally. I think those are going to be really fascinating questions. So again, Francine, yes, this is an individual company, but it has global implications. Yeah, what, uh, what I'm watching is, of course, this you know, climate report. I mean, it was the biggest climate report that ever came out. I think about 200 scientists have been working on it, digesting thousands of studies. The summary makes um, a, a pretty, you know, difficult read, actually. It's the first major assessment from the UN-backed intergovernmental plan on climate change, and it's basically that, look, it's human-caused, it's not going to get any better, and they say that the planet will warm by 1.5 Celsius in the next two decades without drastic moves. So I don't know whether this will have mm. an impact in the coming day, in the coming days, in the coming weeks on what we hope to hear in Glasgow for COP26, but certainly that's a very, very big deal. Coming up, Bloomberg surveillance, well, more uh, is ahead. We'll hear from Bill Lee of Milken and Michael Purves, amongst others. Uh, the big take, it's a great story, actually, chasing Bill Huang after what happened at Credit Suisse. He's in New Jersey. We were talking about it on air. I'm sure they'll also mention it in the next couple of hours. This is Bloomberg.